This is a story that at first seemed too unbelievable to be real. The concept for this film was set in motion more than 10 years ago. From 2004 to 2013, Michael Jason Allen, one of our interviewers who you'll meet later, had a work client named Vada Alini. She told Jason something that she had never mentioned before. That was where she was from and a spectacularly sad event that took place in her hometown of Kindred Township, Arizona, with a population of about 170 people. I should say former township, because it's no longer inhabited and is now a forgotten ghost town like so many others across the southwestern United States. Within the six years of this event, all but 30 people had moved away from the town and eventually, by 1970, the population became zero. It has stayed that way since. Sadly, Vada passed away in 2015, which prompted Jason's renewed interest in this story. Although Vada was regarded as a straight shooter, the possibility of her story being a joke lingered. Unfortunately, she no longer is with us, so we sought out anyone else that might know of the events. After interviewing real people close to the situation and their corroborating stories, she had indeed told Jason the truth back in 2010. In late October of 1961, the former township of Kindred, Arizona, experienced a tragedy unlike any before it. One late night in the very early hours, an entire family was murdered in their home as they slept. Victims include the father, Martin Jenkins, mother, Mary Jenkins, 14-year-old daughter, Shirley, 10-year-old daughter, Beth, 9-year-old son, Barton, and two visiting cousins of four and two years old. Yancey! Hey there, Yancey! Coincidentally, close by resident Yancey McCord was just arriving to his own home in a stupor, dripping in rain and blood-soaked clothes hey that there, same Yancey. very early morning, and was encountered before he got to the door by Constable J.P. Winsley, the only law official in the area. Hey there, Yancey! Constable Winsley was an acquaintance of Yancey. What you doing already out coming back in this morning? I'm trying to borrow some gas until later today. And assumed he had been skinning fish or game, or maybe had a run-in with a coyote. What happened to you? You okay, Yancey? What'd you kill, a coyote or something? What's with all the blood? You all right, man? Come on, come with me, let's go. Come on, let's go. Several hours after sunrise, a friend of the Jenkins children came to the house and discovered the grisly scene. Nancy, I'm sorry. This prompted J.P. Winsley to take Nancy McCord in under suspicion, to hold him until he could clear things up. Just until we can straighten all this out. Constable Winsley discreetly brought McCord to a makeshift jailhouse. According to Vada Elini's story and those interviewed, J.P. Winsley didn't let anyone know he had suspected Yancey for the crimes, or that he'd even seen him arriving home covered in blood because he didn't want to start a lynch mob-like mentality against him just in case he was innocent. Twelve hours later, Yancey McCord disappeared. Did he escape? Did Constable Winsley let him go? Whichever the case, no one has seen or heard from McCord since. To confuse things further, Six days later, Constable J.P. Winsley himself resigned his post and left the area, citing that he needed to take care of family. Where did Winsley go? What became of him? Was he involved in the Yancey disappearance, or was he simply embarrassed of his failure to, con to contain him and couldn't face the entire town where everyone knew him? Perhaps he really did need to leave to tend to his family. Every victim was killed with both a hammer and a knife. Did Yancey McCord, the popular resident with no criminal past, indeed murder the Jenkins family in cold blood? If so, why? There are also speculations that a clan of gypsies traveling through did it in an attempt gone awry to steal the children.
Some of those interviewed in this film will speculate that one of the Jenkins parents did it in a murder-suicide to protect the family from becoming sinners in a quickly changing world. I'm Mark Spino. Join me as we follow Michael Jason Allen and Gucci Mercer as they log more than 2,000 driving miles to track down those involved and those related to the persons and town of Kindred. While Jason and Gucci travel, you'll hear directly from them of their thoughts and experiences on the road. We'll be conducting interviews with those closer to the events who are still alive, such as friends and relatives of those involved, Arizona historians and politicians, and perhaps Yancey McCord himself, if he's still alive. And if we can find him, you'll get to find out. And the results are incredible. The first thing we wanted to do was go to Kindred and see this place for ourselves. Along the way, we discovered some interesting things. Our first destination was still 100 miles away. We had already conducted our first interview with one of the most important figures we'll talk to, Joni Alini. She knew Yancey McCord personally and was the sister of Veda Alini of whose story this film is derived from. I had met Joni years ago on a couple of occasions while I was working for Veda, but at the time neither Joni nor I knew that the other knew of Veda's stories that she had told me. We decided to just do the interview at the hotel she was staying at, high above the city. How much did you know about Veda and Yancey's relationship? You know, they met in 1959 and they lived together for a year. And my dad wasn't real happy with that arrangement, you can imagine. He was on the way to California, and they met in a place called Dateland. And um, then they settled down in this house. And unfortunately, Veda wanted to leave to have a career as a secretary, so she went to paralegal school. And uh, Yancey just was kind of a field hand. So Yancey actually did know the Jenkins pretty well. Yeah, but I, did, huh. I didn't notice there was a, a friendship between Mr. Jenkins and Yancey. Within six years of the murders, pretty much everybody had gone. I went back to visit 20 years ago and it was just empty. There was nobody living there. Were the houses still there when you were there? Yeah, they were, but it was just like somebody dropped an atom bomb or something, all the people were missing. We're here in Dateland, Arizona, and this is the location where Veda Alini met Yancey McCord. As you can tell, this is a new building. It's not the original, but they still make the date shakes they made 50 years ago. Dateland is halfway between Tucson and San Diego. We got back on the road to continue our way to Kindred. Another interview we had already logged was with Rosa Chapnira. Rosa is the niece of victim Mary Jenkins, the mother in the murdered family. Rosa's father was Mary's brother. Rosa was interesting in that she had a good insight on Marty and Mary Jenkins. So what was Mary Jenkins like? She was a sweet person. People seemed to like her in the community. She was involved 
in the church and community. But Uncle Martin was different. He kind of was aloof and held himself above everyone else. I mean, after all, he was a deacon, you know. I was living with my parents in Prescott, Arizona, because I was only 10 years old. And there really wasn't anything there. They may have had a store, seed and feed, I don't know. What do you remember hearing about the events at the time? I remember hearing they found them later, but apparently they were killed sometime after midnight, and but before sunup. And, uh, well, some kids found them. I mean, went to the house earlier in the morning to get with the kids, but couldn't arouse anybody, so he told their parents. Were they getting ready for school or something? I, I think, or, or go play or something, because they wanted to get with them. And uh, then family heard about it. But the the community at that time thought it was a gypsies because there was a group living in the town at that time. But I don't think they did, even though they were unsavory and and dis- despicable. They weren't known to really kill. They would steal or just take anything that wasn't nailed down, and you're looking at it. Yeah, and the gypsies were, were really prevalent in America around the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Now they're called more travelers, but they're gypsies. They're the same thing. There's different kind of groups. Did you go back for the funerals? They had the funeral, all of them together, all seven people at one time. So the, the, they had a funeral. Was it local in Kindred where they did it? Yeah. Okay, so they had a funeral for all seven family members at the same time. Right. Wow. Our next stop was the Orange and Date Groves, where Yancey McCord was working at the time. Along the way, we stopped at a UFO-themed diner for lunch, an omen, as we found out that the farm had been replaced with this. Take a look. This is the exact location where Yancey McCord spent his last day working at the Orange Grove, the day prior to the Jenkins murders. Since then, in the 70s, the land was sold and then flattened. Later on in the 80s, a California computer company bought the land in order to build to manufacture their computer parts. The project was scrapped before it ever got started, and this is what remains of the abandoned buildings. Our next interviewee insisted on coming to us and drove quite a ways to do it. And boy, was it a big fish. Retired Arizona Lieutenant Governor Nicholas Hisman agreed to talk to us about an inquiry that came in at the Capitol in the early 1980s during his tenure regarding the Kindred murders. As a retired politician, I don't blame him for preserving the locale of his home. I would too. Gus Gus and Wembley welcomed him to the show. I believe it was in the early 1980s when a letter of inquiry was sent to the governor's office about opening an investigation. So you didn't hear of the events until it was brought to your desk? No, not at all. Was there an investigation at any point prior to your involvement? Not that we had been able to find. You would think there would have been some uh, uh, documents on witness testimonies or or from Constable Winsley, but there was there's nothing that we could find. Did you ever go to Kindred Township personally once you were introduced to it? Well, by that time, the the township had uh, ceased to exist. There was virtually nothing left. There are some people that aren't from Kindred that don't really believe that the events actually happened, and it was just folklore. No, that's totally false. Uh, There's birth records, doctor's records of of all the children, uh, social security numbers, employment records of the adults. uh, So this has all been verified. Why was the state's investigation never pursued? There was nothing found, uh, no evidence of any kind found that would warrant an investigation. It's kind of hard to have an investigation without at least something. One of our contacts who backed out of their interview had relayed our search to a younger couple in Cottonwood, Arizona. I got a call from the young couple claiming they had recently done some cash per day work for a man they referred to as Yarnell Fritzowski, who lived about 80 miles east in the Sitgreave Mountains. We were to meet them in Jerome, Arizona at a place called Pussifer. We got there and waited. They never showed or answered further contact attempts. While there, I found out that this cool big store that houses a barber shop, a record shop, and a wine bar is actually owned and operated by Maynard James Keenan himself. Keenan is the singer for popular rock bands Tool, A Perfect Circle, and of course, Pussifer. Anyways, we packed in and decided to call up Dr. Lynn Vorbach. 
director of the Arizona Cultural Society, whom I had met at a film festival a few years ago where she was a key figure in a documentary for a state-sponsored tourist film. We were lucky that she was already in the area that day planning a Cocapelli festival in the Sedona Red Rocks, and she was happy to help us out and talk to us about what she knew of the events in Kindred. All we had to do was drive the 27 miles from Jerome to Sedona. Our filmmaker friend Tona Tiu, who lives in the area, came to help out. Dr. Warbach, when is the last time you were actually in Kindred? Well, it's got to be at least seven, seven and a half years. I was told that you would have possibly some information about what went on in Kindred back in 1961. Well, yes, I know the story. Um, yeah, essentially, Yancey McCord uh, happened upon a, a town and became one of the citizens and then became a suspected murderer. Did you see anyone there when you were there before? And did you meet anyone who might have been actually connected there at the time to the murders? Well, I've never met anybody that was there at the time of the murders, but I've certainly had lots of second and third hand information come. Those few houses and buildings that are left over in Kindred, what's going on? Do you know, do you know why some of those are there and some aren't? Well, you know, looters come in, you know, drifters come in and they'll move in for a while and, you know, people wreck things, you know, they don't, they don't respect things. And so, you know, and some of it's just wear and tear, the sun in Arizona, so on and so forth. So, you know, there's, there's no one reason really. Um, some, some towns survive, other towns don't, but most, you know, when they're abandoned, they don't. Early on, I wondered what had happened to all of the property in Kindred, the houses, the businesses, the mine, the farming land. Someone has to own them now. As we made our way to Kindred, we took the long way around to get access to a good night's sleep and food near Tucson. We ran into this. Thousands upon thousands of retired or dormant military aircraft. I think this is the place where they filmed a scene in Can't Buy Me Love. The next day, we backtracked going west again, but this time getting lost on a smaller back road heading to the Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument vicinity. Before we left, we had interviewed a lady who would answer our question of today's ownership of property in Kindred. Her name is Shelley Quinson with Destination Oasis Realty. In the mid-1990s, as a young intern agent, she was appointed to sell most of the properties in and around Kindred. It sounds like no one else in that office wanted the assignment. Shelley, did you know about the Jenkins murders back in 1996 when you were carrying those listings? Oddly enough, it's almost a whole town. So here I am, 24 years old, <laughs> fresh out of college, and I'm being told, you can sell a whole town. <laughs> okay, let's see what this is about. So um, when, when you find out that someone is murdered in a home, and that happens in real estate, I deal with that now. Did you actually go there personally to check it out? We had to go survey the properties when we first got them. And so we bounced out there for a couple of days and we had a makeshift office in one of, one of the properties there. And one of the surveyors came back and he just seemed, you know, a little weirded out. And he had this th thing in his hand. And I said, I looked at it and it looked like just an old dirty doll. When I did more research on it, I found out it was a chatty Kathy doll. And it was back. They had those like back in the late fifties. My mom had one. So anyway, he goes, this is just really strange. Do you think that that's mud or blood? And I looked and the dress was, you know, it, it could have been anything. So where did you find this? And he goes, well, it was a couple properties away from the Jenkins house. Okay. <laughs> and he said, well, this is what's more weird. He turns it around and it's got one of those little rings, you know, you pull and he pulls it and he just looks at me and it says, please change my dress. And I just about fell out of my chair because it was just too weird for me. And um, I just didn't want it around because it just, even the thought if that could have been one of the kids' dolls, I just, you know. Armed with a map to walk off road to what we thought was the Kindred area, we encountered a border patrol agent who assured us that we would find some ruins down the railroad tracks as they supposedly led to a mine. There were ruins and there was a mine, but it was not kindred. Feeling deflated, our only consolation was the man we managed to track down just two days before our trip. Oh look, there he is there on the porch. He <laughs> He's sitting on the porch. Yeah. 
Lay close. Good to meet you, sir. Good morning. You ready to do this? I'm ready. We talked on the phone a few times, so you kind of know the drill. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Let me take a look and see what we got here. Um, actually, uh, you just want to do it out here? Sure, this yeah. is fine right out here. I'm getting your cloud cover going on, so you look really nice. I kind of need to sit in my wheelchair, though, if that's all right. All right. Um, yeah, let me go ahead and uh, put things in. Uh, you don't mind if I rearrange any of this? Oh, right? No, no, no. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Um, let me go ahead and uh, do some, uh, get my equipment out when we're going. You ready to get this? Sure. All right. No, this is not Santa Claus. This is even better. Our consolation prize for the railroad track setback we experienced in what was supposed to be Kindred, but wasn't. He is the eldest living citizen of Kindred that we could find. He was Constable J.P. Winsley's successor after Winsley had up and left town. This is former Constable Lee Close. He knew J.P. Winsley. He knew the Jenkins family. He knew the Alini family. And yes, he knew Yancey McCord very well. This was the mother load of stories and background on all of the key players of Kindred, and he made it easy for us. So, Mr. Close, you took over Constable J.P. Winsley's job after he left, right? That's right. Yes, I did. How was J.P. Winsley's relationship to Yancey McCord? They, they were having a, a little fuss uh, between them. A um, little, little tension over, I don't even remember what it was, some kind of ordinance there, some sign of town ordinance that um, Yancey thought should be changed, but at one time, uh, me and the guys, some other boys were in were in Pete's uh, bar, and there were there used to be a lot of chickens running around in that town loose, you know. And Yancey was there, and this chicken comes walking in. <laughs> he comes walking in out out uh, from the street through the open door. The door was propped open, and uh, we stood there and looked at that chicken and. Um, I was said to Pete, I said, hey, you got a chicken dinner there tonight. And Yancey said, wait a minute now, wait wait just a second before you do anything with that chicken. He says, you ever seen a chicken hypnotized? And I said, no, none of the guys had ever seen a chicken hypnotized. So so what he did, Yancey cleared off a table there. Uh, Yancey took that piece of chalk and he drew a straight line there on the table, you know. And then he took that chicken and he put it on the table and put that chicken's head right down there at the end of the line, but so his beak touched the end of the line, <laughs> and that chicken's eyes crossed, and his body slumped down, and it stayed there staring at that line of chalk. <laughs> that really happened like that. That, that, the, that really uh, happened? That really happened. But Yancey would do those kind of things. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. He, he was a fun guy, all right. It was. It was... It was nice knowing him, and, and uh, as I say, everybody really, really enjoyed the things that he did. He, he was different. When did you find out that Yancey might have been a possible suspect of the Jenkins murders? He was never an official suspect. I, n I never found out that he was an official suspect because there never was one. People started saying, well, it must have been Yancey. Must have, he's gone now. It must have been him. And somebody else say, no, it wasn't Yancey. It, it must have been Bill over there or uh, or Jack over here or somebody had a, a grudge against, against the Jenkins there. As we were walking back from our failed mission to find the town at the end of the tracks, which we likened to a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow, we remembered some small talk about our film to the innkeeper at our motel. She had informed us of a man she said was well connected to the events of Kindred through his father. Rusty Perth is a third generation rancher in the area. We learned that his father was the very last person to see Yancey McCord between the murders and his disappearance from the area. Uh, Yancey McCord came over one day, the day after the murder actually, and asked to borrow my father's tent and a few other things, it real desperation in his voice, so it looked kind of like he was guilty. Um, he let him have it, and he disappeared, and then uh, Constable Winsley, mysteriously, a week later, retires. He quits. So there's a question mark there. Did your father think that Auntie actually killed the family? He did with all the subtlety and the uns uncertainty that he had and wanting to uh, take the tent and everything, it kind of freaked him out. But 
they were friends and they did trips together, fishing trips and everything. So you let him have it. But he had a question mark too, because the other person that was visiting town for whatever reason, nobody knew, the unknown stranger, um, just disappears the very next day. What do you think became of Yancey McCord? Uh, he could be most anywhere. Uh, I imagine that he tried to change his identity as much as possible, change his look, his lifestyle. Uh, so he could be living right next door to us right now and we'd never know it. Uh, possibilities are near endless. Whatever he did before, uh, and blend in with the rest of uh, society. As Jason and Gucci were about to make one last attempt to find Kindred based on Lee Clough's vague handwritten map, as well as rusty personnel helping out with new directions, we received a phone call. It was from none other than Yancey McCord himself. He finally contacted us by voice for the first time. Before this, we only had one exchange through letter mail, and that was nearly a month ago. Our letter was sent to an address at a mail relaying service from Winslow, Arizona. Yancey called to see if I still wanted to talk to him. I was excited to talk to him, but his voice had this unsettling tone and rasp. I'd never before been leery of an 80-year-old person. That is until I heard Yancey McCord speak. The alternate name of Yarnell Fritzowski that I gave the Cottonwood couple? It was indeed him. He had changed his name. He gave me verbal directions and we were off to see him the very next early morning as he lived over three and a half hours from where we received the call. It turns out that he lived near the Seacreed Mountains between Winslow and Payson. We were back in business and it had picked up considerably. We were actually going to meet Yancey McCord and he even agreed to go on camera. There was a catch though. I could only refer to him as John Alfred Sowski and I wasn't allowed to even speak the words Yancey or McCord. Here's to hoping I don't slip. I'm not sure this is the right one. I think. Maybe. Oh, so there's a stand up there. What does it say? I think that might be it. Trees. Oh, oh, oh my gosh, is that, is that him? him? I don't know, is it? I don't know, but he's kind of he's weird. Just standing there, all creepy. He's being all serious. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay, if this is him, then I'm gonna be weirded out. All right, let's let's see here. Okay. Okay, hey, just be real cool about everything, okay? Yeah. I don't know what this guy's thinking him for. I know he might have a gun in his pocket. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> you are now? How you doing, sir? How are you doing? Good. Hi, I'm, I'm Jason Allen. Talk. Amen. But uh kind of have a hard time finding it, but you know, with yeah. the help of the map, we did it. <laughs> so yeah, this is a great place you got here. This is like some of the best scenery I've seen in Arizona. I've been everywhere in Arizona. That's cool. That's really cool. So um, uh, yeah, so I guess we can uh, talk a little bit about things. Uh, is there a, is there a place that we could talk or maybe wherever you like? Okay. Um, all yours. Well, maybe we'll. Uh, well, here. Okay. I was like, you know what? Let me go get my. Let me go get my real camera because this one right here has got okay. bad, bad right. light on it. Okay. Let me go here. Go ahead and cut it, and now I'll, I'll get a real. Wow! I couldn't believe that Yancey was this easy. He even started showing me around the property. Maybe he was wanting to get familiarity on both sides before getting too comfortable and talking about what he was about to talk about. According to him, he built this house himself. This was quite a place. It looks like a guy who ran from life 60 years ago had done quite well for himself. He had a fruit orchard reminiscent of his days in Kindred. He had chickens, as expected from Lee Close's story, dogs, and even peacocks. I briefed him on what was about to go down with the cameras, wireless mics, bad idea with the mics by the way, 
and also the line of questioning I had prepared. He had a few stipulations, but overall he seemed good with everything and wasn't as scary as I thought he'd be. I relaxed quite a bit. Hey boy, go. Seems that like you have a pretty self-sustaining place here. I mean, I see you know fruit orchards and you know nice fresh water creek and animals and I mean, is is that is that just kind of accidental or is it by design? I mean, where... uh, it's not by accident. It's that I did design it. I did create it. Yes, it's done by me. Would you rather me call you Yancey or Yarnell? Yarnell. Yancey's gone. That's a thing of the past. Gone. Yarnell. Why Yarnell Fritzowski? Yarnell's a, a really uh, beautiful, strong, powerful geographic location in Arizona. And the last name I think I just read somewhere. I don't know. I made it up. Next. Jason asked him a question that Yancey considered to be a bit too personal and shut down the interview for a moment. He agreed to continue with more detailed limitations and questioning regarding certain things. If you're definitely here just to talk about things like this, we're okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, yeah, I, if I say anything that, that seems, you know, offensive or something that might be just going to, you know, digging too deep into your personal life, just let me know. I'll back off, okay? So I, I, don't, I don't mean anything by that. How about the Jenkins? What do you what do you remember of the Jenkins family? <sighs> you, you're going into an area that I don't like to relive because it, it, it was a horrendous thing. They they were a nice family. You know, there was no way I could stay there. No way. No. Ever. Do you think it was someone local who did it? I have no idea. I, 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 what, what would what would the motive be? What what was the the reason? that someone would kill all those people. What? Do you know what the stories are about the Jenkins murders? Do you know what happened that night? I kind of disappeared. I didn't want to know. When I heard the extent, um, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to. I guess I didn't want to know anything about it. I just, I couldn't say. Were you friends with the Jenkins family? A little bit. Yeah. What do you remember of the Jenkins family? <sighs> Brief encounter. <laughs> I think that's the best way to put it. It's just that they were a nice family. Um, everybody see, and the family seemed to be outstanding. Nice people, good people. Yeah, now, would, would you be open to going back to Kindred for the first time and that you're 60 years? Why? To maybe show me where things were, where things happened, or no one would know where that go in there. Um, if it would help prove my innocence, as painful as that may be to me, if it'll help you come to some kind of conclusion, let's go. Okay, yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Um, uh, I think, what is it, what, how far is it here? Like maybe a two and a half, three hour drive? Um, would you be willing to go this afternoon and, and, uh, and, and take a look? And... Yeah, let's do it. Okay, awesome. Well, um, Before I change my mind. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go to uh, Kindred. Success! Yancey McCord agreed to go to Kindred for the first time in 60 years, and it was still early in the day. We weren't sure if he was serious, but he said he'd meet us there, so we packed up and threw on some comfortable road trip clothes. Kindred, here we come. I don't think he's going to meet us here. I think he's going to flake from us. There's no way. He hadn't been here in 60 years. Why would he come back now just because somebody like me tells him to? Or ask him to, or whatever. I don't know. Curiosity kills the cat, you know? I mean, he did agree to talk to me. That's the first time, too, in 60 years, right? If he uh, had anything to do with it, I mean, I think he's kind of curious as to what happened to the area. I don't know. The people in it. Well, we are on a gravel road. 
It's so bumpy, your voice sounds like you're talking into a fan when you talk. <laughs> this rental car is gonna go back with a few, few more rattles than it had before. <laughs> Nancy actually left that day. I mean, he, he, he was, he, no one had known he had been taken in. Well, so. not at that point, no. He, he um, was under the, sh the uh, custody of the constable and um, for like a half a day, I guess. And then he somehow slipped out, and then nobody ever saw him from that point on. At what point did you know that Yancey was possibly a suspect of this? Veda called us from school and told us what uh, Winsley had said, but Veda didn't seem worried at all. She didn't really think our lives were in jeopardy. So I think this is it because it said there was a it said there was going to be a gravel road to get to the town. Is is it on there? Yeah. Uh, should be down there. I'm not sure. But we should be getting about I guess five or ten minutes away from Kindred Township or what's left of it. We're going to find out. Um, Yancey McCord said he would meet us here, and we're going to find out if he will or not. I haven't heard from him, but uh. I kind of don't see him coming all the way out here. We'll be lucky if he does, but even if he doesn't show up, we can still get some good footage of the, the town, try to see if we can uh, figure out where things were and where things happened. Um, we did run into a few locals on the way, so maybe we can um, use some of that information if they weren't lying to us. But uh, yeah, here we are, getting close. One day, my father was all fired up and said he was a-fixin' to go to Colorado to tr track down Yancey. But the only person he found was What's-His-Face, uh, the, the ex-constable, Wensley, but he didn't find diddly but Yancey at all. And as far as I know, nobody found him. People had found out later on that uh, J.P. Wensley went to Colorado. He might have misheard Got the names mixed up, thinking Yancey went to Colorado looking for Yancey, but instead it was Winsley. So well, he had no closure whatsoever. There's been no closure for the family. Yeah. His own sister had never found out. He never found out about his own sister. Mary. No, no one has because I think the the if there was any investigation, it was all screwed up. Uh, it just wasn't. There definitely were no records of one. We talked. We talked to Lieutenant Governor um, Nicholas Hisman. Was it done? Well, he said that there was never an investigation. I at didn't the time. think if there if there was, it was J.P. Winslow's personal one. He never he never put it on paper, so there were no records of it. I'm a little scared right now. I think Jason's lost. No, I'm not lost. Yes, look at this. We're in the middle of nowhere. That's because this ghost town. We're lost. Jason? Are we lost? Nope. <laughs> Don't look at the map. The living girlfriend, Veda, she decided she wanted to go to Phoenix and become a secretary, so she went to paralegal secretary school and disappeared. And he was left there in Kindred. And it was sometime in that following year he had struck up a friend with a friendship with J.P. Winsley, the, the constable at the time. So, you know, they were friends. It's obviously a difficult situation. So he arrests him, takes him in, and then um, McCord either escapes or he's let go, and nobody's quite sure which happened um, about a half a day later. So he's never brought to Tucson, and I believe um, they thought they were preserving their community by covering it up and just kind of put it, you know, sticking their heads in the sand, essentially. But what ended up happening was the town imploded on itself. People started pointing fingers. People were suspicious of each other. Before you know it, the population of 171 uh, dwindled because people would leave town uh, because they didn't know who the murder, murderer was. They didn't want to be next. Uh, they didn't want a finger pointed at them uh, for guilt reasons. Um, so right about the time of 1967, the population was down to about 30 uh, individuals. And uh, uh, Veda's young sister, Joni, and her family were one of the last to leave. I think that's the ghost town. 
of Kindred. You see it there in the background? I'm trying to find it. I see something of a town out there. But neither one of our phones work. We decided to try to get to that little town which appeared to be Kindred, so we changed back into our work clothes and braved the jarring road to that town that didn't seem to want anyone near it. After J.P. Winsley left Kindred, what do you think happened to him? Where do you think he went? I, I've researched this film, and I've looked up everyone. I mean, that's how I found you, of course. And he's the one guy I can't find, not only him, but I can't find any relatives of his with, or anyone that admits to being a relative of him. Well, I lost track of J.P. Uh, after he left. And I hadn't, hadn't heard from him for years, but... Back in uh, 1981, I think it was, I happened to be talking to a, a mutual acquaintance of mine and J.P.'s, and I just happened to ask him, I said, hey, have you heard anything about J.P. or heard from him or anything like that? And the guy told me that uh, he, he thought that J.P. died of cancer um, back in Denver. Um, that was in 1981 that, that J.P. died, or they thought he was, so... So he is. He, he's he's dead right now. As far as I know, yeah, yeah. Anyway, well, that explains he, a lot. he was ten years older than me. He's probably dead by now. Yeah, that's almost forty years ago. So yeah, that. We finally arrived in Kindred, and all of the landmarks that Rusty Perth told us about matched. Oh, here. He's on his way, so he'll be right behind us, I'm guessing, from what he said. So this is Kindred Township. It's definitely a ghost town. Right up there is where he said uh, that we would meet at, or actually right here. It looks like we can't drive up there, so I assume this is the spot right here. All right, so we're going to have to walk up there? Probably. Okay, so we're going to have to bring all the equipment. Look at all that. Look at that mountain up there. Isn't that cool? Since fulfilling your last term as Lieutenant Governor, have you heard or looked into any more since then? No. Uh, all my time was occupied reopening my law practice and continuing on with my life and working toward retirement. What do you think happened to J.P. Winsley? Where, do you, where is he now? He's dead. And has been dead for nearly 40 years. So I don't think he's going to be telling us much of anything. This is Kindred Township. This is where everything happened. The murders, Yancey, Veda, Joni, Lee Close, all of them, they all lived here. They were all, they all lived here at one time together. And they all had lives and they were a community and doing things and just working in the world and living and they all knew each other. And now half of them are alive, half of them are dead and half of them live in the same city and they don't even talk to each other. Yeah. Weird. Did you hear that? Yeah. I heard that. Did you hear it? Yeah. What did it sound like to you? It sounded like a, some horse in a stable or something. Like noise up there. No, you want to know what that sounded like to me? That huh. sounded like mining equipment being used. The ownership status of the land and structures made sense now as Shelley the realtor described. This was in the middle of nowhere and there was no resources that we could find. Somebody wants this land to use it for something. And that's where he came up with the idea of, well, maybe we need to get this together for the government. So um, we, we met with one of his um, friends that he had out of Phoenix that, that actually did contracting with the Air Force and government. So he got with us, and we put together a real good business proposal and um, met with them. And sure enough, they decided that that was going to work. They could just incorporate it into part of their training range, I guess. Um, and I was, <laughs> I was glad at that point. It's just, it, it's just, it's, it was a sad thing to have to be reminded constantly of what had happened there. And we had to try to be up and chipper and sell it. And it was a tough one. So that was our only buyer, believe it or not. I basically know what my father shared with me. Um, he was a personal friend of Marty Jenkins. 
and he had a question mark whether or not Yancey McCord did commit the murder because there was uh, someone visiting town and they just took off the very next day. This is where Yancey told us to meet. We're actually in Kindred Township right now. So uh, here we are in Kindred and um, looks pretty weird. It's pretty creepy actually. I know that we have some directions that uh, um, Constable Lee Close, who we interviewed earlier, he left me and wrote down some stuff. And so he did a pretty good job because when we came in, it actually looked like the, the map he drew. So we know where some of the houses are. And um, when Yancey gets here, we're going to go over them. But, you know, he said he was going to be here, you know, follow us kind of like after we left. I don't know if he, what his deal was, but um, we've so been here So do you think he's actually going to come? I mean, being that this is the spot that he ran away from because of the murders? We've been here for almost an hour. He hasn't been here. I don't see anything or hear anything. We don't think we're here. I don't even know if he's setting us up. Who knows? I don't even know the guy. So What do you think he's going to do when he actually sees the Jenkins house? I don't know. But I don't know. I think maybe we should just go look at some stuff on our own. I mean, we got to get footage for the, the, the documentary anyway, so we may as well just start going to film stuff that we already know about. And then when he gets here, we'll just have him show us around. Oh, you know what we should do? We should film the stuff ourselves. Uh, uh, ourselves based off of what we know from the interview people we did and then uh, see if it matches what he says about it See if his memories are the same as theirs. Okay. Yeah, That'd that sounds like a plan I mean because Lee Close actually told us quite a bit too as well, right? Yeah, and so did, already so, so did Joni. So did Joni yeah. Speaking of Joni, she told us how her sister Veda would have known so much about the events How did she find out about all this if she hasn't had contact with Nancy since then? Well, that's that's exactly why I suspect that she kept in touch with Yancey or he mm -hmm. kept in touch with her. Um, and sh I believe she was protective of certain things that he told her as well. I mean, they didn't they didn't have a like a brawl and split up. They mm -hmm. were still happy when they parted. She had different aspirations, though. Still waiting on Yancey to arrive, we decided to get coverage on some of the more obvious structures, as well as some that we recognize from Lee Close's map. As you can see behind me, there's a little bit of mining shafts. Kindred, when it first started, had a little bit of mining, and then people came later on. We've been looking around since we're waiting for Yancey to actually show up, and we found this thing. <laughs> Here's the actual mine shaft. Look how deep that goes. Oh my gosh. Can't see the bottom. So they dump it through there and then it came out. Kind of like millwork. Hey, look up there. Somebody's house. I wonder wow. which house that is. I don't remember seeing that on the map. Do you? No. This is pretty cool. I don't know when he's going to show up, but. According to Lee Close, this structure behind me is actually the makeshift jail where Yancey McCord was held for 16 hours after Constable J.P. Winsley had found him with blood and brain matter on him. From this perspective, you can see that it looks like it used to be some sort of bunker or safe house um, back in the old days. Did you think that Yancey actually escaped or do you believe that J.P. Winsley let him go? I think J.P. let him go. Why do you think he would do that? Because they were acquaintances. I don't think he believed he did it. I don't know why. But being an acquaintance, uh, and you, maybe he wanted to protect him. Even after finding him covered in blood that very morning? He was, you know, he wasn't quite too smart. So you don't believe it was travelers coming through, and you don't believe that Yancey did it. You think that Mr. Jenkins did it, Marty Jenkins. I think Marty was. In, I think Marty and Yancey were involved together. Together somehow, or Yancey found them. But I there's a, those three things that I read about who murders in the family side describes Uncle Martin. God was telling him to destroy the children to kill them because they would be safer in heaven than they were here on earth. And then it, they usually, the murderer then, would kill themselves. Well, and that's a murder-suicide. So did he hit himself in the head? Did he take an overdose? Or did somebody else do it? Because then there you have Yancey. Now, I could be wrong, but it looks that way. 
But Yancey had to be there because he had the blood and the brain matter on him. But where was the second weapon? Where was the hammer? Did your father ever think that Mr. J- Marty Jenkins might have done it, his own brother-in-law? No, he never mentioned he thought Yancey did it. That's just your thoughts. Yes, That's you... just my thoughts, my assessment of it. I'm, I could be wrong, but he was there somewhere. And where was the hammer? This is the Kindred schoolhouse in which the three Jenkins kids actually attended. You know, it's kind of weird. We have some school um, chairs that are out in the original blackboard. The stove over here, there's a good view of Kindred. Imagine the three kids here on their last day of school before they were murdered. You got the bulb hanging down. Oh look, we have a teeter-totter. That's what I think it is for the uh, playground where the Jenkins kids actually could have used it. Could you imagine them sitting on it going up and down the day before they were murdered? This is the lake near Kindred Township where Constable J.P. Winsley and Yancey McCord used to go fishing at. What do you think really happened at that that night in Kindred? The only thing that I could come up with, the only thing I could figure out, was what J.P. told all the townspeople. And J.P. said he he believed that it was a, a bum traveling through that uh, saw the Jenkins there and decided to rob them. It was a robbery gone bad. I really don't think J.P. let Yancey go. He didn't, he didn't. There weren't, wasn't any conspiracy between them or anything like that. J.P. was an honest man. He was, he was honest and, you know, Yancey was too. Yancey was too, he was, he was an honest guy. Ah, there, there wasn't any kind of conspiracy between them like that. That's, that's, that's just plain gossip. This building kept calling us over, so we obliged. Lee drew it on the map, and Yancey told us to meet here. It seems to have been the hot spot back then. It was yet another business owned by the Alinis. This is where Veda and Joni Alini's family actually owned a grocery store slash hardware store. We can't get in, but as you can see, that's where they would have the doors to load stuff in and out and for customers to go in and out as well. Let's take a look through the window. I can see a unused oil or linseed oil can. Wow, even the shelves are still numbered. There's some hardware that's actually been left, if you can see. The back side looked like there was a window here, too. Look, there's some electrical coming out. That kind of murder would indicate that there was some personal vendetta because it was very violent, you know, knives, you know, bludgeoning. That doesn't usually happen if a drifter's coming through and just looking to rob you. You don't, he murdered seven people. Um, and some of them were children. Mm. So it tells me that either there was, he's got, if it was him, it was a loose screw, um, or J.P. Winsley and him were in cahoots, But do you perhaps. think McCord actually committed the murders himself? Well, I mean, it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, if he was covered in blood and he had somebody's brain matter on his collar, It's kind of looking fairly definite. I mean, how does that happen otherwise, you know? We finally ended up at the most significant location so far. This is the house that Yancey McCord rented when he first came to Kindred Township. It's one of the oldest houses here in Kindred. He lived here from 1959 to 1961 when the Jenkins murders happened. Well, we just came into uh, Yancey McCord's house. Um, Take a look around here. This looks like a living room with a... I don't know, it looks like an add-on porch of some sort, but it looks like an add-on living room um, from Yancey McCord. Uh, there's a table there. Let's look over here. You can see there's a there's a leftover, some kitchen stuff here. I don't know what's up with that. There's a couch. Look at this. That table is probably from when he left it. There's a stove that's right here. There's also 
a refrigerator, the doors on the floor. Um, there's some screens. There was kind of remnants of a bed and what looks like a air compressor. Kind of looks like they just left it here. I mean, you have your essentials, basically a stove, refrigerator, air, and a bed. <laughs> so the bare minimum is what it looks like. Oh crap, here we go, we got a kitchen. Look. Kitchen cabinets right there. And of course the uh, kitchen sink here. What is that on the counter? Is that what I think that is? That's, oh my gosh. Is that what that, I think that That's is? That's all rat dropping. Let's go out of here. So this is the kitchen. So this is the house where Yancey McCord and Veda Alini shared, I guess. I can't wait till he gets here to show him this. I don't even know if he's coming or not. We've been here for what, almost two, two or three hours now? And he hasn't, he hasn't even come yet? He's supposed to follow us here. What are your feelings on it? Do you think Yancey McCord actually killed the Jenkins family? It's a possibility. Uh, the constable uh, must have had some reason for locking him up at that point and uh, uh, it's it's hard to speculate but whether uh, the constable released him on purpose or he escaped is uh, probably uh, never know what really happened there there's no way to really tell unless we find him and he confesses to the crime but then it would only be hearsay because there's no evidence to back it up. Can you tell us about any aspects of the case that may have been close to pursuing it but were overridden? Well, the only thing I would question is why the constable uh, released him, released the suspect, or how he was able to escape all within 18 hours of the crime. As the sheriff himself uh, left the state within a week. So a little bit of suspicion there. Yancey finally arrived in Kindred. We're not sure what took him so long, but it doesn't matter. We're just relieved that he showed. We talked and walked around with him for a bit without the cameras. Um, Yarnell, this is one of the buildings that I kind of wanted to save until you got here because it was such in good condition. I wasn't told about this one, but it was really cool. What do you know about this? Everything, I guess. I used to buy stuff here all the time. But, uh... Vader's folks owned this place. I used to buy all the bad stuff, you know, the candy bars and stuff you needed to, milk and supplies. And I can't believe that's all that's left. A lot of memories, a lot of... I think the biggest thing for people was trying to figure out what the motive was. Why? Why would you take out an entire family? Why would you do that? There's little children involved. Who does that? Well, what's, what's this? That's a dance floor. I mean, can't you tell that's a, a dance floor? <laughs> Is this where they had like, was it like a club or something? Well, party time, party time. And I mean, everybody came here. I, I, I can't understand how this could disintegrate that much. And, all those years, but I guess it did. That looks like it was torn down or something. I don't know. Unless the erosion, you see the maybe severe rains year after year after year. I don't know. Startling to me. <laughs> My first look at where I used to live and Dade and I used to dance on that floor. Very special. Very special. C. 
Seeing Yancey have such a tender recollection made me start to question whether or not he really was capable of killing an entire family. Next we went to a location that I chose and had seen earlier, a location that I thought was sure to evoke some long lost feelings he may have had tucked away all these years, a place where he knew some of the folks who populated it to this day. He didn't crack. Yeah, now is this the is this the uh, graveyard where the Jenkins family is buried? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know where which with uh, what I'm, plots they are? No. I didn't stay around. <clears throat> Forgive me. I'm sorry. I, I didn't stay around. <clears throat> I, I hope you understand why I couldn't stay around. That was like a major part of our whole family, the town. I, I, I couldn't be part of this town anymore. I couldn't. I couldn't have to look at the graveyard, let alone the houses, the buildings where where I knew this guy because he ran the local bar. And I mean, I, I had friends here. I had people that lived all over here. Are some of them in there? <laughs> I think several of them are. I don't know. I disappeared from here because I did not want to be part of, of a tragedy, of, of a, a massacre. I keep calling it that, and that's what it was. I mean, you don't kill one, two, three, four, five. That becomes a massacre, see? You want to keep going? I noticed that some of the, um, the graves have those uh, fences around them. Um, did they do that when you were here, or is that something from some older graves? I don't think I ever went to the graveyard here mm. before. Definitely not after, but I, do you go to graveyards much? I don't. Yeah, I don't. Um, you know, in smaller towns, you know, where they have uh, the graveyards, usually, uh, you know, a small population, you usually yeah. know someone who dies. And Yeah, I, I mean, maybe it's a pretty graveyard. Is it, is it a really unique, pretty graveyard that you would go just to look at the gravestones? And I'm not into that. I'm into life. That's why I moved. That's why I live in paradise. It's nature. It's not here. Um, would you mind? Uh, um, I, I guess it's a couple about probably about an eighth of a mile from here. I remember seeing a two-story house. I wasn't quite sure who it belonged to because the map wasn't very legible uh, from the one we got. Um, it's right up the hill, though. Would you would you mind uh, showing me which what this is or, or who might have lived there? Yeah, sure. If you had to go with a solid answer, what do you think actually happened? Those murders were horribly aggressive, and somebody had a lot of rage in them to do something like that. Now, to me, Winsley's behavior was more suspicious. Do you think that Yancey and Constable Winsley were involved together on this? Because I've, I've kind of wondered that myself. Well, they're, they're, they're both the only two that were actually there and knew about things first, and then they both left town. Like I said, all I, all I can say is by, you know, my past experience, I never saw Winsley over at Yancey's house. Mm. And why would they just get together to commit a murder? And now it's time for the moment you've been waiting for, the place where it all happened. Which house is this, Yarnell? Should I believe you that you don't know that this is the house where it happened? So You're going to stand there and tell me that you don't know? I was like, this is the, so this is the... This is house. the house, yes. This is where they all died. And I don't enjoy this, not at all. Did you ever, did you ever come here when, at the, back in, uh, in 59 to 61, were you ever in, in the house? Why would I go in that house, ever? Why would I go near that house? Why is everybody else in this town gone? No one wants to come here. I think only you want to come here. So I noticed something. I don't want to even look at it, all right? Okay. Do I have to stand here anymore? No, uh, can I ask you a few more questions? I, I noticed on the other side of the house that there were no windows. The windows were completely knocked out. And even there was even a wall knocked out on the other side, a back wall back there. Do you know 
I don't know if that, how that happened or not. I mean, probably over time, but do you know which rooms were, whose rooms were in there? Like which family members' rooms were, where they were? What do you want from me? I'm here. That's the house. I haven't come here for nearly 60 years for one reason, because they were slaughtered. That's a whole family that was killed. How does it feel looking at the house now? I, I, I'm looking at it a lot, aren't I? That's how much I like looking at it. Can't you understand that? Nobody wants to talk about this. That I had to leave because of what happened in that house. Everybody had to leave. What more do you want from me? You want me to die right now here because they died? I've lived through their death. Um, maybe we shouldn't uh, speak at this house any longer. Would you mind showing me some of the other places that aren't quite as... Um... Yeah, any, any place but here, okay? Can't you grasp what you made me just go through? I, I apologize, Your Honor. Yancey walked out of the whole shoot and left Kindred without speaking another word to me, even though I tried to calm him down and apologize. Gucci made an attempt too, but even a lady couldn't get him to come back. Before it started getting late, we decided to tour some of the locations in Kindred that Yancey had shown us earlier before the cameras were rolling. I really wanted to talk to him again. There were some serious questions I didn't get around to yet. Meanwhile, Lee's map had directed us to another interesting location. So this is supposed to be uh, Constable J.P. Winsley's house when uh, J.P. Winsley, uh, he was living before he moved away. Um, it's actually one of the better conditioned houses we've been in. Um, you can see right here, we've got lower cabinets and we've got a sink. Um, I think, well look at the floors, they're still in better shape than the other ones. I think I don't know, I, I just, it seems like people have been at all these places since then. It's like, uh, maybe people come through here, I don't know, maybe, I mean, we're not too far from the Mexican border. Um, you could have squatters in here, um, illegal border crossers for all we know, or just, you know, locals that come here to party or something, because I've been seeing things in here that look like it could have been from the 80s or even 2000s. So, uh, yeah, I don't think this place has been completely abandoned. You know, of course it's been abandoned from people living in it, but I don't think it's been abandoned from anyone being in here. I mean, we're here. Why would anybody else come here, right? Let's, let's go in this room. This is a bedroom. Or it looks like it, well, it could have been a bedroom. Look at the stove. Looks like we got some makeshift beds here. Work table or just a desk or something. Look at the wicker chair in the corner. The roof isn't bad. This is probably one of the best roofs, ceilings that we've had in any of the houses we've seen so far. This would be like the, ver the stove's version of a mantle right here. Here's a closet, look over here. cabinets and a mirror. This is their mirror. Look at that. So this is the mirror that Constable J.P. Winsley looked up, looked into every morning when he was getting ready for work. He probably looked at himself in the mirror after letting Yancey go. the last time anybody around actually wanted to talk about the events? I'd say about 20 years ago. Most people want to forget. People wanted to forget about it. They just wanted to move on. They wanted to move on in their life. I did, you know. Uh, that's why, as I say, that's why I moved over here to Mesa, because I wanted to move on with my life. And, you know, that's, that's, that was the downfall of Kindred. How come you didn't you know, get state or federal or even just from another county, some other officials involved in the case to, to find out what really happened. 
because we wanted to keep it within the family, so to speak. That's why, and, and I, when I became constable, I figured JP had already handled it anyway, and then I, 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 I dropped it because I didn't believe that Yancey did it. I, I still don't. Do you think this case will ever be solved? Uh, at this point, uh, no. Unless somebody comes forward and confesses and, uh, and is able to give uh, the details of, of uh, the circumstance. So Yancey McCord could be the killer that Arizona forgot about? It's very possible. It's very possible also that it could have been a transient passing through. Uh, at this point, we may never know. Anybody could be. Once we realized that Yancey McCord wasn't coming back and we were on our own, we decided to go inside the Jenkins house and see for ourselves. We had hoped Yancey would have guided this tour. Once inside, it was very eerie, but more of a feeling of sadness than a feeling of creepiness. Here we are, the Jenkins house, according to what Lee Close told us and a few other people we interviewed. Can't believe we're really here. So this could have been the room where, uh, well, it actually would have been the room where one of the Jenkins family members, members were murdered. Um, as big as it is, it looks like it probably would have been the parents' room where it would have been Marty and uh, Mary Jenkins, the parents, probably were killed in this very room where we're standing. It's kind of sad to stand in here, isn't it? Yeah. Watch out for the hornet's nest up there. They're actually in it. Of course, you come in further, you can see the, the, the doors. I guess this was kind of their version of uh, arch doors. So it looks like this wall here has been knocked out completely. Oh, and can you see the modern, more modern uh, construction there? Um, it just goes down a hill. Look at that. Wow, this whole wall just got knocked out. And back in here, you can see how in the they have the light here so they did have they did have actual electricity so this is one of the rooms where some of the family members probably would have been killed in oh i don't see any oh what is this is that blood on the wall oh my gosh look is that blood on the wall i don't know get a focus on that i don't know it does look like it drained down i'm ready to get out of here look at this Old bed, look at the little headboards there. So it looks like we have uh, some beds. It's definitely a big living room. Look, there's a stove pipe up on the, by the ceiling up there. Look at the dresser with the old National Geographics. Look at the dresser. Go to the bottom of the drawer, look at that. Let's go in here. This looks like, this has got to be, this looks like it was like a back living room or a kitchen of some sort. Because it seems to go out to the back way. You see this tree? Are you getting that? So here we are in uh, the second part of the house. That's two adjoining areas. You can see where the sink was. Look in here. There it is, right there, yep. There's a, looks like a toilet. That's a weird looking toilet. Yep, and look at you can see the shower knobs right there. Right there, right there. So this is where the Jenkins family took their showers and did other stuff. Let's get out of this room. Someone could have been killed in the shower in here or something. Okay, so this actually looks like the real living room to me. You see right here, it looks like they might have even had a ceiling fan and a light installed. Do you see that? Right here? This would have been definitely from the time of the 50s left over. And of course, you see here we have light switch here. You got that? Oh, the kitchen. Look at the, look at the hornet's nest or bee, beehive or something up there where the light fixture was. Look at this. The old cabinets and even... Old jars. <laughs> I 
Did you see that? The camera? I saw it. Come over here. This door just opened on us. This door just opened by itself and there's not a single there's not a single thing of wind out here. Look, look outside. There's no wind at all. Oh my god, I just got the creeps. <laughs> the door wow. just opened on its own. I swear to God. Let's go in this other room here. I don't want to go in that one. <laughs> oh, look at all this stuff over here. I think someone's been in here hanging out since then. It looks like somebody has come in here and just kind of camped out or squatted in here or something. Who would want to? Look at all the crap in here. Careful, there could be nails and things back here. I don't like the looks of this. I'm getting, I'm getting out of here. I don't want to go in there. They used to be a family. They were a family at one time. They were just living their lives, doing what everybody does, and then a guy comes in and just kills the whole family, and then it turns into this. This is door. One day, all of our homes are going to end up like this, no matter where we live or where we're from or what time we're in. Everything ends up like this sooner or later. This is weird. Seven people were killed in this house with a hammer and a knife. Think about that. It's almost like somebody hated Mr. Jenkins to take that ball peen hang hammer and just drive it through his brain. Nobody really ever came to Kindred. They may pass through Kindred, but there was no reason to go to it uh, unless you live there. I think the, the killer got away with it, whoever the killer is. It was worth another seven hour round trip drive because the questions I had ready for him was make or break for this film. So I called Gancy the next morning and I somehow convinced him to talk to us one more time. He said we could meet with them later that afternoon at his house as he didn't want to leave again. Most people don't want strange visitors past the front common areas of their home. This was the opposite. He would only allow me to film the interview in a particular bedroom in the house where his now deceased partner would never go into a room he had recently rented to an old friend. His reasoning? He said he didn't want me to disturb her spirit as he knew she was present in every room of the house except this one. I had no problem with that. However, I did wonder who this old friend was. I hope to ask him at the very end of our conversation. This is the last interview of the film. Why did you agree to let me talk to you? I probably never would have except you sounded very honest on the phone after our exchange or written exchange and if you really want to know the truth then the truth is i had nothing to do with the murders and if that's what you're really looking for fair enough um 
Do you know what the stories are about the Jenkins murders? They were a nice family. And there were seven of them that were killed, slaughtered. A massacre. I don't know how else you can... It's something I, I... I don't want to remember it now. I don't really want to do this, but I'm doing it for you. If, if you're really trying to... Maybe you can find the killer. That would be great. Do you wish you had continued to California rather than stopping in Kindred? And if, if, if you had gone to California, what do you think you'd be doing today? I, I don't know. I, I um, stayed for a while in Florida and the surf wasn't big enough. The surf was supposed to be better in California, so I was going to head to California. And on the way there, I met uh, a woman who was very became very special to me, and that's why I'm... I stayed, I, I, I'm here now. If I had really wanted to continue to California, I probably would have done it after my escape. And I'm going to call it an escape. I'm escaping from the, the horror of what happened. I just, I didn't want to be around it. And meeting the woman on the way to California, are you referring to Veda, Eleni, and Dateland? Well, Veda is why I stayed in, in, in Arizona. That, that's... I mean, haven't you met someone in your life that, uh, and they seem to look at you and have the same feeling back? You want to spend time with that person. I did, wouldn't you, if you met someone like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> then you understand. Um, I have to tell you something that you probably uh, may not know. Um, Veda Alini actually knew her personally. Um, she was a client of mine at work about 10 years ago. And according to her, she hadn't told anyone this in a long time. And she started mentioning you and she told me that you were uh, her boyfriend at the time. She had a picture of you that she actually showed me. And I took a picture of it while I was training her and I had it on my phone. Actually, I actually have it with me right now. You're gonna see it? You wanna see it? No. No? Oh, you know, I'll look at you it. You would like to see it? Okay. Of course. Um, there you go. So this is, this is Veda and myself? Yeah, this is you guys. I guess. Do you remember taking that picture? No. I... Probably did. I just, I, I. Doesn't look like it was taken in Kindred. It looks like you guys might have went to an event somewhere, maybe in the Phoenix or Tucson or something like that. We look happy. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <sighs> yeah. Would you like to keep that picture? It's yours, you. sir. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you something else, uh, kind of in the same line as that. Did you, <sighs> yeah. when you moved away from Kindred, did you happen to meet someone or get involved with another lady between then and now? Yeah. Were you guys married? No. What? It was like a marriage, but uh, no, we, we didn't get married. I haven't haven't seen or heard from her here. Is she? Are you guys still together? Or what? No, she died. Sorry, hear that. What, what year was that? Two thousand and six. So, uh, you know, I need to uh, to let you know that uh, Veda actually is the one who started this whole movie. She gave me the idea for doing this. She doesn't know she did, but uh, just by her telling me the story inspired me to want to find out what's going on and to make this documentary. So a lot of the things that I'm asking you are actually things based off of uh, stories and facts that she's told me herself personally. I haven't talked to Veda since I left. Yeah, she said she hadn't heard from you since no. then herself. Getting back to subject, um, what do you think really happened in Kindred that night in 1961? Something horrible. Are you aware of the stories about you yourself? What? There are a lot of people that I've interviewed for this that 
believe that you may know um, a little more about what, what happened because you were close to some of the people involved. Um, and they said that you uh, knew Mr. Jenkins pretty well, too. How would you think, how would you feel if that family that you knew, even though it wasn't really close, but at least they lived near you, you ran into them occasionally, how would you feel? if they were brutally slaughtered the way they were. Would you even want to be around that? Would you want to have any connection with that? Yeah, me neither. Okay, you understand. Now, who do you think could have done something like this? Who do you think would have done something like this? I have like no this? idea. I, 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 why would I know? You were you're the only person that was around at the time that I can talk to right now that that would have been there and you know surrounding those immediate events. I just thought that you might have an insight or something you could tell me. No, I I, I thought we'd kind of been through enough questions already. I, I I have no idea what happened. It sickened me and I left. Uh, Constable J. P. Winsley, uh, he left a week after you did from Kendra. Did you know that? He left after I did. He did. Yeah, about a week after uh, the, the Jenkins murders, he actually left Kindred as well and not only moved out of town, but he moved out of state. Well, I can understand why. He was probably the officer that found the bodies, and I can understand that totally. Do you know where he went? No, I have no idea. Do you? Um, Do you know where he went? Yes, I actually uh, found out after speaking to several people, um, and I got to talk to him. Uh, to to Lee, uh, Lee Close. Well, and did, did you talk to JP? Did you talk to him? No, unfortunately I couldn't. But what I did find out from Lee Close was that he found out that JP Winsley died of cancer in Colorado. So he thinks that's where he went. Uh -huh. And uh, so he's no longer around. So uh, uh, really, you're the only person that was actually involved in the whole you know morning after events. And uh, so really, you're the only person I can go to to find out more about this. Well, why was I the only person? Were there other people there? That, that From found? what people know is that you were taken in later that morning by J.P. Winsley and asked questions about the murders because you had come home early in the morning or late at night uh, after being out. I guess that you were doing some early morning fishing or something like that. But um, yeah, we'll get to that later. We don't have to worry about that right now or anything. Um, what I really well, wanted to ask... I, I think there... I remember vaguely meeting with him, yes, but there were... He was interviewing everybody in sight, practically. This, this was a nightmare. You cannot imagine. Unless you'd lived through it yourself. This is where I felt that he was wearing down and about had enough of me and everything in general. It was now or never to lay it all down before he clammed up and shut down. What about the stories of Constable Winsley taking you in on that morning under suspicion of the murders and questioning you. What stories? What are you talking about? What? It's just, the, the people have said that, that you came home early in the morning with blood all over you on your clothes and you had been gone all night long. and People have said that? Yes, people have said that. In fact, Veda was the first person to tell me about that. They said they, they, they said they didn't know or understand why you were taken in for questioning related to those, and then you disappeared from town less than a half a day later. If I had had blood all over me, wouldn't you have told that to me before? And wouldn't Veda have said something about it? Are you saying that Veda said I was covered with blood? And she found out from who? Uh, she said that J.P. Winsley called her about a week later when he left town, and he said that he had left Kindred, and he told her that she should know about that in case you might be coming to Phoenix and she could be in danger. You know, that sounds pretty fishy. If he found me covered with blood and didn't tell anybody about it for a week, I think that's bullshit. I, I maybe even think that you're making that up. Are you making that up? No, not at all. Uh, um, you, you'll see in the, in the documentary, if, uh, I'll get you a copy of this when it's over, but um, there were other people that had mentioned this too. Um, Joni uh, Crenhill had mentioned this, and she was uh, friends with uh, one of the uh, Jenkins girls. I don't believe you. What about the coincidence of you leaving Kindred that next morning 
Why would you do that? There's no coincidence. I told you why I left. And if I'd seen myself covered with blood, yeah, I probably would have fled. So you you think do you so you don't remember ever being taken in by Winsley and being questioned about this? No. Where's the proof? Did did he leave records? Did he put something on paper? Or is it just you're telling me that Veda knew because he told Veda? Then why didn't they arrest me? You know, I have to to ask you: Is there anything that you would like to say to clear things up, or maybe make an admission of some kind, or just? Did you say admission? That I did it? You came here because you wanted to know the truth. Is that right? You wanted to find out, but you didn't think I was a suspect at all. And what is all this bullshit about Veda and... and I, I, so there's anything you want to... Clear, I just thought that you maybe you might have a story that you want to tell to, to get things clear up so that way I don't put anything false on, on camera that didn't really happen. Because, I mean, some things make, make it look bad for you and some things, you know... Then you don't have proof, do you? No, I have no proof at all of anything. That's the reason why I'm asking these questions. I just want to know what Goodbye. your side is. I just thought that maybe you want to just Goodbye. kind of tell us... But there's nothing you want to... Goodbye. I shut everything down and Gucci and I tag teamed him to calm him and let him know that these are the types of questions that anyone would ask and I wasn't just trying to be difficult. He made a phone call and afterwards he gave me one more shot. This was it. I'm sorry about those questions before, but is there anything that you want to to clear up or maybe just kind of make known the real truth of what you think really happened, who you think might have done it, or... I mean, is it, someone I mean, had to have a very good reason to kill seven people. You haven't figured that out. I all I have to go off is what people have have said that are close to the situation. You know, Veda said she was there. Constable J.P. Winsley wasn't around, but Lee Close knew Winsley Close, and he told me these things. So I just thought that maybe there's something that you want to maybe just tell us to clear things up, or I mean, is there anything that that you can you know, just let us know the real truth of things. Here, I'll see. Is there anything you want to say? I think you better leave. Is I, th it, I think you better leave. Right now. Is, is there anything you want to say just to clear things up? You don't have proof of anything, do you? No, I don't. It's got people, people that have said things, but I just want to know from you, is there, is there anything you want to clear up just to get things straight? Just let it all out. People have told me these stories, and they've told me about everything they've seen. They've told me about you having the blood on your body. They've told about him taking you in for questions, and all the evidence points to you. Oh, it's, there's no other way. I, I just don't understand, you know, because... You don't understand what? That, that no one else could have done this. Everybody says that it was... It, they just don't think that it could have been... It, the, the odds that you would have come home with all that blood on you and they would have been bludgeoned that night. That's never happened. Those two items. And then Winsley taking you in like that. And did he let you go? Did you escape? What, uh, how did that even happen? I don't... You, there's no one else... It, it just, if you you could admit it right now, and and this whole whole thing, I mean, I may not even put it on camera. And what? It, You're putting it on camera. I'll delete the footage. It, it's it could be taken down. Anything could I could I could change it. Anything could happen. Everybody's dead but you. And how do you know that Veda knew? She told me ten years ago when I was training her. She told me. She told me that you, all these stories about you, everyone else told me about you, and everyone else seems to say the same thing about you. And what are you going to do? With it? What are you going to do? Huh? What? It's just a documentary. It's all it is. It's not, nothing more than that. What proof do you have? Veda told me herself. Well, why did you do something then? I talked to the The police know about this documentary. Even they How? know about you. I just want to know. Yancey McCord, did you kill the Jenkins family in 1961? They're trying to they're trying to use my information to do an investigation. What? No! Don't shoot! Please! Don't shoot!